Injection vulnerabilities, including SQL injections, are the third most common, according to OWASP, which is a nonprofit organization that is concerned about web security. Platforms like PlayStation, TikTok, Twitter, and Snapchat have been vulnerable to this, and they pay thousands to the ethical hackers that discover these vulnerabilities. This is Zaid from Z Security, and in this video, I'm going to introduce you to SQL injections and teach you how to discover them and exploit them to access sensitive data on the database, such as usernames and passwords. But before we start, show me some love by smashing that like button, share the video with your friends, subscribe and hit the bell if you haven't done so already, so you get notified every time I upload a new video. Now in this video, we're going to be relying on black box testing. So that means we do not have access to the code of the target application. Therefore, we're going to be sending inputs to it, observing the result. And based on that, we're making educated guesses to discover vulnerabilities and exploit them. However, if you have access to the code of the target application, if you work for the company or if it uses open source code, then you can automate the whole process of discovering vulnerabilities, such as SQL injections and much more using a program that is made by the sponsor of this video, Sneak. Sneak is an open source developer security platform that can scan through the code and automatically discover vulnerabilities and fix them. And it doesn't stop there. It can even scan configurations, containers, and dependencies to give you maximum coverage. What I really like about it is that it integrates with pretty much most tools, IDEs, and workflows, such as GitHub, Docker, AWS, you name it. All you have to do is sign up for free using my link, sneak.co forward slash zsecurity, import your repos, and let Sneak get to work. It'll automatically scan the code, find vulnerabilities, and suggest fixes for you. All the findings are compiled into a nice report for further analysis later on, and fixes can be applied within a single click. Now, SQL injections are vulnerabilities that can be found in web applications. But before we explain how to discover them and exploit them and what SQL is, let's just zoom out very quickly and remember what a website is. So a website is basically just a web application installed on a server. And a server is simply just a computer. So right now we have this computer. It could be any computer. It could be your personal computer. And when we say it's a server, it just has certain applications on it that allow it to act as a server. Now, generally, servers on the internet are accessible from any computer on the internet. So they're hosted on the cloud, as they call them now. And basically, it has a real IP. And then anybody connected to the internet is able to communicate with this computer. Because this computer has a specific application that allow it to act as a server, we call it a server. But if you strip everything down, it's basically just a computer with special programs installed on it. Then we make that computer accessible over the cloud, over the internet, which makes it very appropriate to use as a web server or a server that can be accessed from other computers or other locations. A very common application that could make it act as a server is a web server. What is a web server? It's basically an application that you can install on any computer. So the computer doesn't even have to be exposed to the internet. You can install it on your own local computer, even if it's not connected to the internet. It's just an application. And what that application does, it specifies a certain location within your file system. And in that location, you can host files. So anybody connected to the same network as you, or if this computer is exposed to the internet, then anybody that is on the internet will be able to access the files stored within the web root or the file that the web server uses to serve files to the users. Web servers usually also contain the web application files. So the website files could be images, they could be normal HTML files, so don't, they don't really contain code, but the web application files, they actually contain code written in a programming language that can process information and manipulate it and do useful tasks. So it would be written in languages like PHP, Python, Ruby, and so on. And most websites that actually do something useful other than websites just that just simply display information like a shop website, they would actually be written in a programming language such as these. Now, another very common component of a website is the database. 
So the web server contains the files like images, styling files, HTML files. These are all just used to display the website, to render the website. And then you have the web application files, which is the ones run on the server side to process data. But the data is usually stored in a different application, which is called a database. Now the database contains a number of tables and we have in here a sample of a table. We're assuming that this table contains products that are being sold on a shop website. So you can see we have the ID of the products. We have the title. So this is an iPhone, an iPad, a mouse and the price. We have the price in here for each of these products. So the web server contains the HTML pages, the beautiful pages that you actually see, the ones with the, it contains the images. So the images for the iPhones, the iPads, the mouses that this website is selling. It also contains a web application that interacts with the database to display all of these products. So the web application itself doesn't contain the products. The product information is stored in the database. Now, the database contains a number of tables. This is just one example of a table. It will contain tables, for example, for the users, and it will contain the usernames and the passwords. And then users, when they log in, the web application will communicate with the database to check if the user that you're trying to log in with exists in the database and checks if the username you supplied is the same one as the password. So it's very important to understand the role of the database. Web application stored on the web server, it just communicates with the database, gets information and then displays it or does something useful with it. But the data itself is not stored on the web server. It's not stored within the web application. It's actually stored on the database. The web application communicates with the database using a markup language called SQL. So whenever you load the products page, for example, in a shop website, for example, at Z security, if you go to the shop page, it's going to communicate with our database and it's going to retrieve all of the products that we have on our store. And it does that using a language called SQL. If the web application itself is vulnerable, as a hacker, you're going to be able to inject your own SQL statements and retrieve data from the database that you're not supposed to see. So you're supposed to see the products. That's fine because the shop website shows it to you, but you're not supposed to see the data in the user's table, for example, because that will expose the users, the, their emails, their phone numbers, and possibly their passwords. But if you're able to inject your own SQL queries, you'll be able to manipulate this web application and communicate with the database and access the user's table, possibly read the admin and log into the website as the administrator. And then you'll be able to do whatever that the admin can do on the website. But anyway, usually when you're at that stage, when you're able to inject whatever SQL statement you want, you don't even need to log in as admin in many cases because you already have access to the database and the database usually contains all the information you need. It contains all the users, it contains all of their data, and it contains all of the data that is stored on that website. Whatever you need from that website, it's usually stored in the database. It's not really stored in the web server. So now that we understand what SQL is, how can we discover it? Very simple. We try to inject a statement that returns a false and analyze what happens on the website if the website breaks. And then we try to inject a statement that returns a true and that shouldn't break the website. So if the true statement does not break the website and the false statement does break the website, then the website is actually accepting whatever we're giving it. So it's executing the statements we give it. And therefore from there, we conclude that it's vulnerable to SQL injections. And then we can inject other queries that allow us to access the database or upload files or read files and so on. So let's go ahead to the first example and have a look at how we would go about discovering an SQL injection. As you can see in here, we have a normal shop website. You should go ahead and test every single aspect of the website, use it as a normal user, see how the website works normally without exploiting it. So you get an idea of what the pages look like first, so that when you break the pages, you know what a good page or a normal page looks like and what a broken page looks like. So anyway, you can see here from the top, you can actually filter products based on the tags we have in here or the categories. 
So for example, if we click on accessories, you will see that it's gonna filter the products that we have in here and you're only gonna see the accessories. Also, if you look here on the top, you will notice that the category is equal to accessories. So we have a parameter called category and the value that is being sent is accessories. Now straight away, if you look in here, you'll see that the title in here says accessories. So if we just type anything after the accessories, you can see that it's being reflected in here. And therefore, before you even try in SQL injections, you should actually try a HTML injection as shown before, and then try an XSS because you have user input that is being directly reflected on the page. And that's usually a really good cue to test for XSS and HTML injections. Now, this is not our topic, so that's why we're not going to do that. But I'm just trying to tell you how I would go about a pen test if this was a real world scenario. What we're trying to test for is SQL injections. So we're just going to go back to what it was. It just said accessories. And to test for SQL injections, we want to put a true and a false statement as mentioned in here. Now, before we do that, let's try to understand what's happening when you actually go to this website, when we're sending this URL to the server. What happens is we have an SQL query. This is the original query that is being executed by the web application. It's doing something like this. It's using a select query from a table called chop where the category is equal to the user input. So in our case, it's called accessories in here, not food and drink. But in this example, the category is food and drink. So what you see in here in yellow is the user input. Everything in white is being written by the web application itself. We can't really play with this. We can only change what's written in yellow because whatever we put in here after the equal sign is being placed in yellow between the two quotation marks in here. So what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to inject our own code in here. If we manage to do that, this will be sent to the database engine and it will be executed by the database engine, which will uh, retrieve whatever data we want to retrieve from the database. So the injection is going to look like this. You have the name of the category, food and drink. We're going to write our own single quote to close this. So as you can see, the web application itself closes it in here, but we're going to add that manually in the input. And then we're going to say and one is equal to one. And we're adding two minuses after it because this can be used as a comment to comment the extra quote that the web application adds by itself because we're adding our own manually. So the resulting statement is going to be select star from shop where the category is equal to food and drink and one is equal to one. Now we know one is equal to one is true and we know that there is a category called food and drink and therefore this statement should not affect the execution of the page. The main thing you want to pay attention in here is we're manually adding a single quote to close the quote that the web application opens itself and there we're using a comment at the end to basically tell the web application to ignore this last quote that is added by the web application itself because then we will have an extra open quote and that would break the whole query in here because every open quote should be closed. Then we're going to run a false statement and this time we're saying select star from shop where the category is food and drink which is true and one's equal to zero. Now this time it's false. Now, if the page breaks when we do this, then we know that the web application is actually executing whatever queries we're sending it. And therefore, we will know we can use other SQL queries in here to communicate directly with the database and retrieve whatever data we want from it. So let's go ahead and test this. Right now, we're actually opening a category called accessories and we're going to add our single quote after it. And we're going to say and one is equal to one and then we're going to add our comment and perfect as you can see the page loaded exactly the way it should be nothing changed in the page so this means this statement that we added did not affect the execution of the page which is what we're expecting because it's true so we're selecting the category that is called accessories and one's equal to one which is true now let's change that and say one is equal to zero 
and perfect as you can see now the page broke which means that even though that there is a category called accessories the web application is not able to retrieve it and that's because we said and one is equal to zero which is false which is breaking this select query because this, the query is becoming like this and therefore now we know that we are able to manipulate this web application and inject SQL queries in here and whatever we put in here is actually going to be executed on that website. So remember what we said at the start where we said this page, for example, is loading products. And what we want to do is we want to inject an SQL statement in it to load data from the users table and hopefully get the username and the password for the admin. So even if the admin page is not vulnerable, we'll be able to log in as a normal admin. We can do this because we know that whatever we post, whatever we put in here, is being executed by the web application is being sent to the database engine and the database engine is executing that query. Therefore, we want to add queries in here that would be useful to us. We're going to be using the union select queries to select data from the database. But before we do that, we need to determine the number of columns that are being loaded. And this also can be used to discover SQL injections anyway. So this would be another thing that you should do to verify that the target page is vulnerable to an SQL injection. So we know that if we add comma and one is equal to one, the page loads normally. If we add comma and page one is equal to zero, we can see that the page is breaking. Now another test we can do is we use the order by clause. We can say I want to order by one. And as you can see now the page loads fine. So we're saying we want to order by the first column. But then if I say I want to order by a really high number, so we know that there is no way, there is no way that this database contains this many columns. But we're saying we want to order by this column and we're going to hit enter. You'll see that the page will break. So again, this is another way for you to know if this page is executing whatever SQL queries you're adding. But the order by can also be used to determine the number of columns. So if we do order by one, the page loads. If we do order by a really big number, the page breaks. Now, what if we do order by five? Page breaks again. That means there is less than five columns. Let's do order by three. Page breaks again. And let's do order by two. And the page loads. So now we know that there is only two columns being selected in here. This is very simple in this example, we only have two. So you could have just started using your select statement with two columns. But sometimes you have targets that might have 20 columns or 15 columns and I've had that before. Therefore, you would have to try one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to 20. Now it's a bit time consuming, but obviously you can do it. But this is a quicker way of doing it. Also, like I said, it's a really good way for you to verify that the target is vulnerable. The next thing you want to do once we know that we have two columns is start building up your union select. Now, this is going to be the statement that we're going to use to select data from the database. So as you can see, the backend itself is actually using a select statement to select data from the database. So we're going to be using another select statement that will be appended to the existing select statement. And therefore, before we start using our select, we're going to have to say union. Because the union keyword allows us to run two select statements within the first query. So as you can see, the web application is using a select statement by itself. And we're going to be injecting our statement in here. And that's why we're going to say union first. And then we're going to build our statement. So we're going to say union select. And then we need to see where can we inject data so that we can see it on the page. And that's why we usually do one and two because we want to see where are we going to see one and two on the page if the page is vulnerable. Now, if we do that, it's not going to work. So let me show you what's going to happen. If you have a valid SQL injection and we know we have a valid SQL injection because we verified it using a number of ways. The page should have loaded normally and you should have seen either one or two or both being displayed on the page. 
but in this case, this is not happening. And therefore, again, I'm gonna include the cheat sheet, but this comes with experience. When this happens, you can just do null instead of one, two, just to verify again that everything is working. And again, you're back, the page is loading again. So now that we know, okay, well, our SQL injection still works, it's just it needs a different way of exploiting it. And it's probably using a different database engine than what we're used to. If you've also done my courses, we need to see where can we inject data and which of these can we inject data so that we can see it on the page. And that's why we usually do one and two, but we see that one and two doesn't work. And therefore in this case, so let me just do it here because it's bigger. So we have null, null, and we wanna see where can we inject data. So instead of this null, I'm gonna do a, for example, like this as a string. So let's do that in here. So we're just gonna do A and perfect. So we know that anything that we put in here in the first entry before the first comma, whatever we put in here will be displayed on the page. And therefore, if we substitute that with an actual value that we wanna select from the database, it should be displayed in here. So let me show you real quick. Again, this goes back to the cheat sheet. Let me actually just load a good cheat sheet that I wanna show you in here. So you can see, like I said before, you could see the different type of comments that you can play with, the different ways you could select a database version. So usually I would start with trying with MySQL cause that's the most common. You should try the others, but I know that this example is actually Postgres SQL, therefore, we're gonna put that in here, in the A, and we shouldn't have the quotes around it. Hit enter. So as you can see in here, you have a very interesting entry. You have the exact version of the database engine. So now that we know, if we want to exploit this further, we need to use database queries that work with PostgreSQL. You can also see the database engine is running on this version of Debian. So obviously this could be very useful for post exploitation later on. But going back to the cheat sheet now, if you wanna get anything, you're gonna scroll down to the PostgreSQL queries. Now, the next goal is to actually start selecting data from useful tables. So hopefully from a user's table that contains usernames and passwords. Now you could try to guess that. So you could simply just, without even knowing that there is a table that is called users, you could just do select union select, for example, username, and just say from users. You could just try that and you could get lucky. First of all, I don't like guessing. And in many cases, you could have things that precede or go after the user in here. So you could have, for example, table, uh, whatever users, and then you'll never be able to guess the table name and you'll never be able to get your data from the users, even though you have an SQL injection. Therefore, you should get a list of all of the tables in the target database. And that varies depending on the target database engine. But as you can see, the way that you could retrieve database content is very, very similar. So you could do select star from information schema tables to get a list of all of the possible tables on the target database. So basically information schema tables, it's a default table that exists on the database. And this table is designed to contain the names of all of the other tables in the current database. That's why you could always select data from it and you'll always be able to get the table names from it. So there is no guessing in here. So we're trying to get the tables now. So we're gonna try to select the table name from information schema.tables and that's all we need. We're gonna close it. And let's go ahead and run it.
and perfect as you can see we got a list of all of the possible tables on the current database and as you can see some of them start with PG some of them might start with other things that cannot be guessed and therefore it's much smarter to actually do that instead of just trying to guess the name of the users table or the name of the credit card tables or whatever that you're trying to get. So if you look closely, you'll actually find a users table, which is right here. So you could have guessed it, but the point is I want to show you how to list all of the tables because like I said, in many cases, you might not be able to guess the names of the interesting tables, or there might be interesting tables that you don't even know that they exist. So you can't even think of their name. Now, the next thing you want to do is get the columns. And again, if you go to the cheat sheet, you'll see how you can get the columns, but it's very similar to MySQL. So all you have to do is instead of saying table name, we're going to say we want to select the column name from information schema dot columns where the table name is users. So we're trying to know the column names in the user table because our statement usually works by saying select column name from table name. So this is usually the format that we do. We do select column name from table name. So we know that the table name is users, but we don't know what to select from it. Now, again, you could guess that you want to select the username and that you will be right if you do that. But I just want to show you how you could select the columns as well. So basically what we're saying is we want to select the column name from information schema columns. So this is another default table that exists within the database that lists all of the column names on the database. But we're saying we want to select the columns only where the table name is users. So where we have the interesting table that we're looking for. So we're going to copy this. We're going to go back here and let's paste it. And if you scroll down, you, you can see we have a column called username and a column called password. So you were right in guessing that, but I just wanted to show you how you could actually get the right names for the column names without guessing. So now that we know we have a username and a password, our statement is going to be very, very simple. So going back to our one, we can select a username from instead of information schema dot tables from users. Copy this, put it here. And perfect. You can see we have a username called Carlos and we have wiener and we have administrator. Now we could also select the password instead of the username. And here we go. We have all of the passwords for the users. Now we don't know which password corresponds to which user. So again, we can use the where statement similar to what we used it when we were selecting the column. So we're doing union select the password from users and we're going to say where the username is equal to administrator because that's the username that we seen earlier. Hit enter and we have the admin password in here. So you could go ahead now and log in with the username and the password of the admin without having to discover an SQL injection in the admin. And you're not really going to be hacking the admin login page. You're basically logging in with his own credentials. So essentially, we are exploiting the web application that was designed to only load data for products for users to load the admin and their password. Now, I hope you find this video useful. Let me know what you think in the comments. This video is actually taken from my full course on bug bounty hunting, where I cover a lot of vulnerabilities along with SQL injections and the other injection vulnerabilities. And I actually dive much deeper in SQL injections and the other vulnerabilities, covering more complex examples and how to bypass security and so on. So if you're interested, check out the link on the top right for more information about that course. And don't forget to like the video, share it with friends, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to get notified every time I upload a new video.